Okay. Uh, some of you uh, have been asking about our brother Ralph Kershoffer, and uh, I've asked Mike if he would just give a little report uh, about Ralph. Some of you may not know him. Uh, Ralph, like Mike, is from the States, uh, but has been doing a uh, great work uh, along with Mike and others up in the Golden area for quite a number of years. And several months ago, Ralph had a very serious uh, stroke uh, that has incapacitated him. So some of you were asking, so Mike, if you would just give a little report on. Sure. Yeah, Ralph uh, suffered that stroke on the 18th of May. They were on the way after spending the, the winter down in Houston back to their farm up at Parson to south of Dolan. And they, they flew from Houston and got to Spokane, Washington, and he didn't make it through the night. He, he suffered a stroke. He's, he's lost the uh, use of his left, left leg, left arm, and left side of his face. But you can't take the joy out of Ralph. <laughs> I saw a picture of him here recently, and he's trying to smile. You can see it in his eyes. <laughs> and I, I know that you all love him like I do, and, uh, and like the Lord does, and, and he loves the Lord. And he, uh, he's in a wheelchair when he, he has to have help to get out of bed into the wheelchair. But, but he's, uh, his wife, Linda's taking him for walks. Uh, he's not walking, she's pushed in the wheelchair, but he's full of joy, and uh, he'd love to be here. We miss him. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Uh, again, just before we get into the subject for this hour, or whatever time it takes, uh, we'll, uh, something that Mike said about the very limited time that there is uh, in most assemblies for uh, the instruction of the brethren and uh, of those in the assembly uh, with regard to the Word of God. And uh, it seems, unfortunately, that uh, in many places, you know, if uh, someone is getting over 40 to 45 minutes, uh, everybody has on their minds uh, lunch or the kids or whatever. There's always legitimate reasons, aren't there? Uh, in an article that I wrote, I haven't tried to publish it anywhere. It was more to vent than it was anything. But uh, I calculated in one week a student at school will have about 25 hours of instruction. Uh, if you take that about five hours of class a day for five days in a week, of course, they're never there for five days in a week. They always seem to be off for something. But anyway, from September to December, there's approximately 17 full weeks. And if you remove four weeks during that period for students not being in school due to holidays, well, that leaves 13 weeks. And so those students are still getting uh, 13 by 25 hours of instruction. Uh, which is 325 hours of instruction. Uh, our uh, sons-in-law, both of them have had go-arounds with the elementary school on the stuff that started to be introduced by way of curriculum there. And uh, so our kids, right down to the youngest ones, are sitting in 325 hours in a quarter, basically, of whatever propaganda uh, they wish to teach. So if you take a whole year, uh, you uh, get maybe about 500, uh, sorry, about 825 hours of instruction for a student. That's leaving out summer and holidays and everything else. So 825. And we think of the assemblies and uh, on a morning, uh, add it up, if you take that 45, if you make it 45 minutes and you multiply it out for the year, uh, then uh, you are getting uh, less than a full work week of opportunity to instruct the believers. That's it. How does that compare to what the kids are being taught? 
And if you take a student's life over its life of 12 years, say, we're looking at 9,900 hours of instruction over 12, 12 years. What are the people of God getting in that time? So uh, again, that's something that's been in my mind for a long time with regard to the time uh, that we have to instruct believers. And the subject I have chosen to deal with as a uh, look to the Lord is hopefully uh, not going to fill in for 9,900 hours of instruction, uh, but certainly I hope that it will do something uh, that will be an encouragement uh, because what we're going to deal with uh, is in some sense uh, being uh, pushed uh, in the evangelical world today, and I'll explain what I mean by that in just a moment. But what we're going to deal with, I hope that we will have uh, opportunity uh, to think about what God is doing in the world, and my title that I was using, let's see if we can make that bigger somehow, There's a way of doing this, and for some reason, anyway. I would like to light, the light off, or the one that's Yeah, that'd be great. So the, the topic I, I want to look at is what in the world is God doing? And I don't mean that in the sense of uh, we're confused about what he's doing, uh, but to think about what he actually is doing. And as we do that, what I'd like to do is teach the whole Bible. <laughs> That's pretty ambitious. But we're going to try and follow the themes that we find starting off in the early parts of Scripture and follow them right through to the book of the Revelation. And I have some uh, purposes in that, obviously. Uh, one of them eventually will be uh, to emphasize the urgency of the hour. And it's very appropriate that uh, Mike started with the gospel. Uh, because really with the urgency of the hour and the little time that we really have, uh, we have a real responsibility to get the gospel out. And then another part of what I want to try and achieve is, uh, I think about how many people study the Bible or don't study the Bible. They maybe come and they read a little bit here and they read a little bit there. And uh, they have no framework in which to piece in what they read or what they study. And so often out of that you get confusion. And so what we'd like to do is try and give an all Bible framework for what God is doing. And then when we deal with the individual parts, we can begin to see how they fit into what God is doing in the world. And then we will try and look at uh, God's... Uh, end game uh, as, uh, as we go through this and look at what God uh, wants to do and achieve eventually and how he's putting all that together. My wife's a quilter, but I don't want to talk about quilting. I just want to notice that when you're a quilter, that's the word that they use, they're a quilter. But I'm thinking of a tapestry, and you've probably heard the illustration before. I don't know what you call people who do tapestries. But anyway, uh, the whole idea of the scriptures is that God is weaving everything together uh, so that, again, the final tapestry looks beautiful. But the backside of the tapestry is a mess of threads and everything else. And really, that's us, isn't it? As we go along uh, each day as believers uh, move through this life and have whatever sort of effect they would have. God is able to take it and also take what unbelievers do and don't do and weave it all together so that at the end, the picture that he wants eventually comes out and he weaves all those little bits and pieces together. And so again, this idea of looking at the whole of the scriptures is to look at God's tapestry as to how he is dealing with things in this world today. 
and uh, where he's going with it all and where it has come from and why certain things are in the scriptures as they are and how they fit together. And so we'll hopefully be doing that a little bit. As we go through, uh, one of the emphases that I want to make is with regard to the kingdom. And the reason that I want to make that as an emphasis, it doesn't mean that we're going to study the kingdom exhaustively during this time, but I want to give, again, a framework for understanding what the scriptures talk about the kingdom. And part of the reason that I want to do that is if you have in your assemblies young men and women, and not even just young men and women, but also older ones who get a lot of what they get from the internet, those who are generally on the internet, unless they actually go looking for something that, uh, let's put it this way, that we think would be beneficial to them, uh, they will often get something that comes from uh, people like Mr. Piper or Mr. Sproul or Mr. MacArthur, etc. And they have a particular theological outlook, which I don't believe that most here would hold to. But that's what young people are, are uh, reading on the internet. Uh, I won't say in books, there's very few few that seem to read books anymore. So as we think about this again, it is hopefully putting a framework in which you can help guide uh, young men and women and, and perhaps older ones too in the assemblies as they think about this. Now, why? Why is this true? Why is this happening? Well, if we think back the early days of what they like to call the Brethren Movement, one of the things that was true of the early believers in that movement was they published and published and published and published. And the, their publication had a massive effect. I think they were all like Warren, you know, a book every week. <laughs> yeah. And so they, they published, but there was all sorts of journals, there were all sorts of periodicals and magazines, there were books that were coming out all the time, and they had a massive effect on not just the Brethren movement, but on evangelicalism as a whole. And so in North America, uh, the uh, thinking uh, with regard to the dispensations, thinking with regard to future events, etc., that uh, that we tend to hold to among us, that tended to be the general understanding of evangelicalism in North America. And then in about the 50s, I have a book at home I haven't finished reading yet, but it's all about how those from a reformed perspective put a plan in place to overcome this type of teaching and to insert reformed teaching. And who publishes today, apart from Warren, <laughs> who publishes today? It's all the reformed teachers, right? And that's what we're hearing on the internet. That's what people are reading. If they're reading articles. And that's generally what there is in the Bible schools and also in evangelicalism as a whole. And I would suggest to you that their concept of the kingdom is wrong. And so we will try to put a framework from Scripture on this concept of the kingdom as we go along. Now, we won't miss out on the scarlet thread that is uh, salvation right from Genesis to Revelation. We won't miss out on, on things like that. But I want to make a little bit of a special effort on the idea of the kingdom. And uh, so that hopefully we won't be confused as to what the Scriptures say. So, as we approach this, uh, let's uh, read, first of all, from the Scriptures. That's always a good thing to do. So we'll start in Genesis. We're not going to read right through to Revelation, but we will read a little bit from Revelation as well. So Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. 
from Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31, continuing into chapter 2. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Now let's go to Revelation 22. And the last few verses, starting at verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him that heareth say, come, and let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. The Lord will add his own blessing to the reading of his word. So as we think about the scriptures, uh, we could think uh, really in terms of eras of world history, from Eden to eternity, and uh, I'm sure you could divide it up in a number of ways, but we could think of creation to the fall and then the fall to Babel or Babel and Babel to Abram and Abram to Moses and Moses to Babylon and Babylon to the advent of Messiah and the advent of Messiah to Pentecost and Pentecost to the rapture and the rapture to the millennium and the millennium to the eternal state. So basically, uh, uh, breaking up of what we see in the scriptures and uh, what we see as we read through the scriptures and, and put ourselves in the midst of what uh, is going on here. So uh, really we in our time would be in this period of Pentecost to the rapture. <coughs> and as well as thinking of these eras, I'd like to think in terms of the dispensations and we'll thank our brother Randy Amos, who is enjoying the presence of the Lord right now uh, for this particular diagram. I think it sets it out very well. And as we move through the scriptures and look at them, we will have a look at what dispensation uh, the events are happening in. And uh, we'll continue to look at them in those contexts and that move from dispensation to dispensation as we go through looking at the overview of the scriptures and what God is doing. So first of all, uh, we'll look at creation to the fall. And in the, looking at that, uh, we are looking at the very first of the dispensations, which as you will see here, is uh, the, uh, has been assigned the name free will. And so uh, if, I know you can't all read it there, so I'm going to read out some of what our brother Randy has on this, this diagram with regard to this particular dispensation. It's a time and a period and an economy in which the ability, uh, there is the ability to, free, to freely choose and to say no to God. But, he adds in, there is no permission to do that. In other words, if you do that, then you are disobeying God. And uh, it is couched in the uh, verses that say, uh, every tree of every tree thou mayest freely eat, but of the one in the midst of the garden, you're not to. And so, the, at the bottom, the various characteristics 
are, first of all, uh, there is a new responsibility which is dispensed by God. And that's the characteristic of a dispensation. There is a new responsibility given by God for man to follow. And then we see that invariably there is man's failure to obey. And following that, then we see what you would expect if man disobeys, you would expect God's judgment. And then we have God's grace to continue. And so uh, God just doesn't say, that's it, we're done with everything. Instead of that, he gives a way to continue. And so in this uh, first dispensation, uh, Brother Randy has said, that the new responsibility is the ability to choose. And then secondly, man's failure is to choose to disobey. And thirdly, God's judgment is death and separation that we'll see in a moment. And then God's grace to continue is through sacrifice covering for shame. And so, of course, we think of that in terms of our uh, first Father and mother, Adam and Eve. And as we uh, think about them, uh, we try to understand uh, in what setting all this happens. And so, of course, as we see them, we see them in the setting of perfection uh, that is untested. And very soon, Satan is going to come along and he is going to attack. Now, of course, we know that Satan himself uh, disobeyed God and reacted against God. And as a result of that, he was expelled uh, from the presence of God in, uh, in the sense of being one of his servants. He's now a disobedient servant and he has uh, come out in rebellion against God. And so he is going to try and do what he can to be like God. That was his problem in the first place, as we find out in Isaiah and also in Ezekiel, that he wanted to be like God, and therefore he set himself up against God. And as he does that, then we can expect that whatever God does, he is going to try and disrupt. And of course, that's what we're seeing in the early chapters of uh, this book, of Genesis. And so as we look at this beginning, we see the immediate attack of Satan, and it comes through deception on Eve. And so in chapter 3 and verses 1 through 7, we have this story that everybody will probably be familiar with, and that is how Satan comes and he seeks to deceive Eve. Now, this is a direct attack but it is an attack through deception. And so as he comes, he is immediately attempting to disrupt what God has put in place. He is the arch enemy. He is the one who, uh, as a result of what he achieves with Eve and thereafter with her husband, Adam, uh, taking the forbidden fruit, uh, he becomes what the scripture calls, uh, well, the scripture gives him a number of names. Having achieved what he wanted to achieve, he became the prince of this world. That's a phrase that John likes to use when he speaks about him, and he uses it in John 12, uh, 31, and 14, 30, and 16, 11. And so he's the prince of the world. And we'll talk about the implications of that in just a moment. And then he's also the God of this world, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. And uh, then in Ephesians, Paul uh, mentions that he is the prince of the power of the air. And uh, in uh, 1 John, in John's epistles, in chapter 5 and verse 18, uh, or verse 19, uh, we find that John says that the whole world lies in wickedness. And really what it's talking about there is Satan's power. 
it's in the power of the wicked one. And so, again, there's this massive change in this world uh, from what God created to what now is. Uh, and the rule that God had is now broken. We'll talk about what that rule was in just a moment. And then, as well as that, we know Ephesians chapter 6, where we are told that he is the one against whom believers wrestle. And he's a roaring lion, Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, uh, seeking whom he may devour. And so Satan usurped God. This was a successful, uh, from Satan's point of view, this was a successful attack on God. Now, when we think about this, often uh, we think in terms of uh, chapter 3 and verse 15 of Genesis, and we are glad to see that God immediately has a remedy for what has happened. And uh, we see there that he says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and he shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And so God immediately puts the remedy. And usually that's talked about in the sense of the one who will come as the Redeemer, the one who will defeat Satan on the cross. And it's usually couched, uh, couched in the terms of redemption and of salvation, etc. And so it should be. And so it is. But it's more. Because this is God's uh, declaration also as to how he is going to regain the kingdom. Now, how did he lose it? Well, let's think about uh, what the situation was. When God created Adam and Eve, he gave them dominion. Now, when you come across that word dominion, and you'll come across it in Daniel, and you'll come across it in Zechariah, etc., and it always has to do with rule. And so in chapter 1 of Genesis and verse 26, it says, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air and the cattle and all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And then verse 28 in chapter 1 of Genesis, it says, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply replenish the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And so in this dispensation of, uh, of uh, free will, uh, in which Adam and Eve have uh, been given this responsibility, and in which they fail, uh, so we have the fact that in their creation, they were to be rulers, rulers on behalf of God, and that's on behalf of God's kingdom. God created, in creating the earth, created a kingdom in which uh, the uh, first people, Adam and Eve, were the rulers under God responsible to God. And so what they are ruling is God's kingdom that he has created on earth. And what Satan has stolen through deception is the power over that kingdom. Now, obviously, we know that God is powerful over all, uh, but God will uh, work throughout the rest of human history, and he'll work throughout the rest of the scriptures that were, records human history, and eventually he will take it to the place where that kingdom is regained and his king will sit as ruler of it on the earth and then that will continue into eternity. But in the meantime, Satan is what we said he was, the prince of this world, the god of this world. These are not just words. This is not just a way to say you're a bad boy. This is real power that he has taken. And of course, when he comes to the Lord Jesus and the Lord's uh, temptations, Satan is offering him something that he has. 
But the Lord refuses because this is not God's way of regaining the kingdom. And so as we see uh, this unfold, what we are seeing is an assault by an enemy that takes at least for uh, a period the kingdom that God has created. And God is going to work and make, bring it back. John Phillips says there are three main lines of truth running through the scriptures, salvation truth, church truth, and kingdom truth. And we must distinguish the one from the other, keeping them separate in our thinking to mix them up results in confusion. And can I just say that's really uh, reformed theology. It's confusion. It's a mixing up of these things. And so uh, I would totally agree with them. I would put them in a different order, though. I would put them in the order that they appear in Scripture. First of all, God's kingdom that he created and that Satan, by deception, stole. And of course, the kingdom uh, uh, in Daniel, uh, it is uh, something that is talked about quite a bit. There's kingdoms galore in Daniel. And so in chapter 2 and verse 44, it says, <clears throat> in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. And of course, Genesis 3.15, we've already mentioned in regards to salvation. And then as you get into the New Testament, another major thing is the church. And uh, in 1 Timothy 3.15, uh, we find that the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. Uh, where it says, if I tarry long, that you may know how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And so as we move through the scriptures, we are going to see particularly the ideas with regard to the kingdom and the ideas of God with regard to salvation kind of progressing side by side and we will see eventually that the one who is king of kings, uh, the one who is the savior, is also the one who takes the kingdom. And eventually, in God's end run, uh, the savior offers everything up to the father. And uh, things are good. So in, these, in the garden... Uh, we uh, see these names and titles with regard to Satan's earthly authority that we've talked about. Uh, but I just want to think about Satan's operation in this time and also in Old Testament times. Of course, when you think of Satan in the book of Job, uh, you'll remember that he uh, had an access to God uh, that you wouldn't necessarily expect. And so in Job 1 verse 7, it says, The Lord said to Satan, Where did you come from? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down in it. And the same thing in chapter 2 in verse 2, The Lord said to Satan, Where did you come from? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down in it. And so there is a a sense in which Satan still has access to God uh, even at the moment. And uh, in that access, it seems that he can challenge God. And, and of course, he's the accuser of the brethren. And that's exactly what he's doing with Job here. He's coming before God to accuse him. And uh, God, uh, in uh, his wisdom, allows Satan to have some effect on Job's life, as you know. And then, uh, as we mentioned in Luke chapter 4, we'll not go to look at the verses, uh, but this is again where Satan comes and tempts the Lord Jesus and offers him something that he can genuinely offer because he stole it. He's basically saying, do you want this back? And the uh, Lord, of course, says no. Why? Because it's not God's way. This is Satan's way. It's the same with any bully. If you come from a policing background, you'll know this. Any bully who gets you to operate on his terms 
hides you. <laughs> and that's the way a lot of criminals work. And then in Romans chapter 8, verses 19 to 22, And then if you could quote this, Romans chapter 8, verses 19 to 22, uh, we find the uh, desire of the creature and even of the world. And so it says, for the earnest expectation of the creature waits for the manifestation of the sons of God, for the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. Why? Because of Satan's work. And so, as we've already mentioned, Satan has taken a certain amount of control that God, in his wisdom, is allowing him to continue with at the moment. We have this, and I put this up again for this reason. I want you to think in terms of this verse, not just in terms, we've already mentioned it, but I want to re-emphasize it. This verse should be thought of in terms not simply of salvation, and of the work on the cross in salvation, but it is also going to be God's declaration of taking the kingdom back. And how does that happen? Well, that happens in the cross also, doesn't it? Remember when the Lord was speaking to the disciples and uh, he basically told them, Satan's time has come. He's going to be defeated at the cross. When I do this work in obedience to the Father, Satan is done with. And uh, mentioned yesterday in, uh, uh, in Westside Chapel that uh, Satan is operating as though he is out on bail at the minute. In our legal system, a person can be brought before the court and they can be convicted of a crime and so they're done with, if you like, but they may not go to jail immediately uh, because they'll be allowed out on a certain amount of bail and they will still operate in the world until the day of their sentencing comes. And so conviction and sentence could be months apart in our legal system. And it's somewhat the same with Satan. At the cross, he's defeated Christ has done everything that he needs to do to both provide salvation, but also to reclaim the kingdom back from Satan. But Satan is operating right now between the time of his conviction, the cross, and the time of his final sentencing or disposition, which is, Roman, uh, which is Revelation chapter 20, when eventually he is consigned to the lake of fire for eternity. And so in our time, Satan is in this period and he knows that he has to make the most of it uh, as he's out, uh, if you like, on bail. And often, uh, I mentioned yesterday too, that often criminals, when they are allowed out in that time between their conviction and their sentencing, they go right back to what they were doing because very often they owe people a whole lot of money. And so they have to make it somehow if they don't want to get killed. So they go right back to it. And it's the same with Satan, if you like, that he is operating and uh, knowing his time is somewhat limited and uh, knowing that his grip on the kingdom is limited uh, because Christ has done it all at the cross. So this verse... Uh, Theologians like to call the proto-evangelium. Proto having to do with first. Evangelium having to do with good news. And of course, it comes over into, uh, both of those words come over into our language. Uh, 
Pro often is connected to words that are longer, and then evangelium has to do with evangelism, as we've been hearing about good news. So this is the first good news that God has given to man since sin and corruption came into the world. And so as a result, uh, for man, uh, Adam and Eve, they are expelled from the garden. Therefore, the Lord God sent them forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. And so he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Again, we were dealing with this chap other parts of chapter 3 yesterday in, uh, in the chapel. Uh, but just to mention that this is a mercy of God to drive them out of the garden. You know, here they are. They are corrupted now with sin. They now know what sin is. They now know what it is to be a servant of Satan. And if they had access to the tree of life, can you imagine living for eternity in that sin. And so really this is a mercy of God to drive them out of the garden. And of course today, uh, that tree of life is nowhere to be seen on the earth. But what a blessing there is, because when we get to chapter 22 in Revelation, we find it again, and it's right there. And it's there in chapter 22, and verse 1 and 2, where it says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was, the, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. What a wonderful grace of God, that that which in the garden could have caused untold misery for Adam and Eve had they accessed it. But in the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem, where you and I will be if we know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, here's the tree of life and it has this positive, positive, positive effect on all. So we have uh, moved from uh, God's judgment on them and uh, we uh, move along in history, uh, move along in time. And so now we are coming up to Babel. Grew up, everybody called it Babel. So if I go back and forward, you'll forgive me. And uh, as we look at this, uh, we're looking in this period at two other relatively short dispensations, uh, that's of conscience and of government, uh, which we will see. Oh, I don't have my, uh, hang on, we'll go back here, back to the dispensations. And so conscience, uh, Randy suggests is from Genesis 3-7 to 8-22, and then government from Genesis 9-1 through 11-32. And so as we move on, uh, here we are now uh, dealing with uh, different effects. Uh, first of all, in the first dispensation, there was the ability to choose, but now we have the knowledge of good and evil. And as well as that, uh, we have uh, thoughts that are evil continually. And uh, we see uh, this when we get to chapter 6. And in chapter 6, uh, in verse 5, it says, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And so uh, we have moved from the time when sin has entered the world, 
corruption has entered the world, there has been time for the population of the world to grow somewhat. And uh, as it has grown, uh, now we find that the evil of man's heart is coming out very strongly. <coughs> now, of course, when uh, Adam and Eve were driven out of the garden, we immediately see the worst of what man can do to man. Right at the very beginning, basically, almost of creation. Uh, because in chapter 4, we have Cain and Abel. And uh, you would think, perhaps, that uh, when sin enters the world, well, they weren't sinful before. Uh, and, uh, of course, Adam and Eve weren't sinful before. Their offspring certainly were. They were born in sin, just like you and me. Uh, but you would think being so close in time to that time of perfection that it might take some time for the effects of sin to kind of develop and grow. But we don't have that. We have the immediate, if you like, going to the extreme of sinfulness with regard to man on man, and that is murder. Not only murder, but fratricide, murder right in the family, killing a brother. And so we have uh, this indication that things are not going to be good as you continue <coughs> on. And that's exactly what we see. And uh, that we see the earth becoming so evil that God really gets exasperated with the earth. And it says, after that verse that we just read, where, it, where God saw the wickedness of man great in the earth and the very imagination of his heart, uh, the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. And then it says, it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I'll destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repents me that I have made them. Does anybody see a problem there? A problem for God? Any suggestions? He couldn't do Genesis uh, 3.15. Absolutely. If God does exactly what he says there, that he'll destroy man from off the face of the earth, He's just become a liar. I say that respectfully. But God can't let things end here because he has made this Genesis 3.15 promise and it is a Genesis 3.15 intention to provide the way of salvation and to provide the retaking of the kingdom. And so God, uh, he's not... He, he knows exactly what he's going to do. I'm going to put it in this terms. He's sort of caught in a catch-22 here. If he uh, destroys the whole world, then he's just proved that he's not God because he made a promise. And as you move through the scriptures, you find repeatedly in various places that it says that God cannot lie. And it says it in one way or another. God cannot lie. And so if he fully destroys the world and all that's in it, he has just lied and he's not God. And so if you like, from a human perspective, this catch-22 situation, we find a way in which God now continually works in history. He chooses a man. And so he chose Adam created Adam, now we're at a different point, and he's about to destroy the world and all that's in it, except that he chooses a man. And so in verse 8, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. <clears throat> so the wickedness of man we saw, and in verse 8 we have this great but, one of scriptures but you know it comes in and says but things are like this but and so here we have but but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations 
and Noah walked with God. Now, why was it important that Noah was the man? Uh, well, uh, if we go back a little bit, uh, we find uh, that God has done something very significant. Abel, who would have been the one to, if you like, begin the line that would lead to Messiah, has been killed. But God replaces Abel. And so at the end of chapter 4, it says, Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son, and called his name Seth. For God said she hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And to Seth and to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. And then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. And as you continue into chapter 5, you begin to get this genealogy. And so this genealogy continues, and this is the replacement for Abel. And so the replacement is now going to be the root from which the Messiah eventually comes. And if you follow the genealogy, you will find that Noah is from that root. And so here we have a just and righteous man that God has found on the earth, and he is in the Messiah's line. And so, again, Satan, in his attacks, through the evil that he promoted on the earth, brought the earth to a place where God says, I'm going to destroy it all. And if he had done that, not only would he not have kept the promise of Genesis 3.15, but he would actually have wiped out the line from which the Messiah would come. Satan is subtle. Satan's hand is on in this. As we go through the scriptures, we will see Satan's hand at every turn as he tries to uh, uh, usurp God's plans and to bring them to nothing. And so here we have this situation in which God is now going to bring the flood on the world and uh, bring the catastrophe that destroys everything. And is it any wonder that uh, these chapters are the chapters of the scriptures that are particularly under attack in our days? You know, uh, basically Satan is again motivating everything in opposition to God. And so this whole idea that God didn't create, the whole idea that there wasn't a universal flood, all of these things are direct attacks of Satan. And it is no different to the day in which we're reading about in these chapters early in Genesis. It is a picture and a record of Satan's deception and Satan's direct attacks to uh, thwart the... Uh, promises of God. What time did we start and what time did we finish? Uh, we're over time, but it, uh, we're over we time. started later too, so I'm not sure. Just okay, I'll just introduce. We're trying to make up this time, uh, this cool time, right? I'll just take two or three minutes to introduce the next movement, if you like, and that is uh, to Babel or Babel. And so where Babel is, uh, is a place that is very much in the news in these days, uh, in uh, present-day Iraq. And of course, uh, on here uh, is Ur of the Chaldees, from which God's man will come. And in this area uh, is the Babylonian plain, and you'll notice again that it is between the rivers. And uh, in between the rivers is where we see uh, chapter 11 of Genesis. And that's where the uh, people of the day says in verse 1, the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. 
So the picture is that now it's after the flood, and after the flood uh, we have the spread again, the population of the earth, and the development of that spread across the earth, but uh, in not across the whole earth, is across certain parts of the earth, uh, in around uh, where the ark uh, came to rest, and a little bit of spread out from that. And in the, chapter 11, verse 1, it says, The whole earth was one language and of one speech. It came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. And again, Shinar is often interchangeable with the name Babylon. So we're talking about that same area. So they're in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. Truly, and they had brick for stone and slime for mortar, and then they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower. And so we have two things here. They're going to create their own society and economy in the city, and they're going to create their own religion in the tower, which the children of men built. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. So we will start there the next time. We have moved forward, and uh, we have seen uh, that Satan is active in every part, and it all has to do with him having taken the kingdom. But, of course, God is still at work. And so Satan is still at work. And we have seen the uh, Messiah's line uh, preserved by God uh, through the various things that Satan has thrown at God and has attacked God with. And so we'll see where that all leads. And we will get uh, further on into something that forms the basis of absolutely everything in world history, and it will include us in the church, and it comes very soon in uh, Genesis that we will see. So we'll talk about Babel or Babel the next time, but let's just close there for tonight. Gracious Father, we thank you again for your grace and your goodness. And dear Lord, uh, we often realize that there is this very definite battle going on, uh, a battle of those unseen forces, uh, the battle of Satan and his de demonic hordes uh, against uh, the Father, against our God, against his Christ. And so, Father, as we come before you tonight, we pray that we might have a greater understanding of that and how it works itself out throughout world history and how you will bring it all together and dovetail everything together to achieve thy purposes and achieve, Father, bliss for thy people as we will be with the Savior and as we will worship at thy feet forever. And so, Father, we thank you and we praise you for thy great mercy and your kindness to us in the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. amen.